Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome. My name is Seamus Hayes. I work for Genesis, and as a member of the Atlantic Committee, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to help facilitate this, this session. Today is day five, and it's our last day of this year's Atlantic Virtual Festival. There have been some really insightful and thought-provoking presentations and conversations all week, and this panel discussion we're about to have promises to be no different. This is our seventh year running this festival, and unfortunately, it's the second one we've had to do virtually. Over the five days, we have had 40 events with over 50 speakers. We've had over 5,000 people register, and we would really like to thank all of you who have joined the sessions during this week. Uh, I hope it has been as informative for you as it has been for all of us. And as we've said all week, we, we would encourage all of you to get involved and participate. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Atlantic Fest, and don't forget to use the hashtag Atlantic. Throughout this presentation and the rest of the presentations this afternoon, you can always use the Q&A function to tell us why this topic is of interest to you. Everyone has their own story on how they had to change their work, and in some cases, what they were working on over the past 12 months. So today, we'd love to hear, uh, we'd love for you to share those stories with, with the panel today. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you by ITAG. ITAG is a West of Ireland, non-profit industry-led community of indigenous and multinational technology companies and organizations. We are all about what's of interest to our tech community of innovators and practitioners along Ireland's western seaboard, what we call the Atlantic Gateway. Atlantic 2021 has been run as a free event this year, uh, and we are very grateful for all our sponsors who have helped to make this festival a reality. We greatly appreciate your continued support. Uh, as I mentioned, we'd love for all of you to participate in today's panel discussion, where we will be reflecting on what it takes to drive a business in a pandemic, and the challenges and the lessons learned. Uh, you can see that we have a Q&A button uh, and we'd love you to use that to tell us what you're hoping to get out of today's session and you can access that from the bottom right hand corner. You'll see a, a button with three dots and you can access the Q&A function from there. So please do get involved with the session via the chat and the Q&A. So with that, let me introduce you to our esteemed pal panel. We have Dorothy Craven, who's the Vice President, Managing Director and Site Lead of Rent the Runway in Galway. We have Brian O'Rourke, who's the CEO at CitySwift. Paul Madden, who's the Director of Commercial Operations at Clubforce, and Rory Conroy, the Site Lead at Diligent Corporation. Now, I've had the pleasure of meeting this group prior to today, and honestly, there was no way I was going to be able to keep them all in check during a panel discussion. So we're delighted to have Jess Kelly with us, uh, and she's going to facilitate this panel discussion. You'll all be familiar with Jess as News Talk's uh, technology correspondent, where she contributes across their schedule, including News Talk Breakfast, Pat Kenny's show, and The Hard Shoulder. She also holds the tech talk show on Saturday evenings. As a technology correspondent on a busy radio station, Jess takes a hands-on approach when reviewing the latest gadgets and devices on the market, explaining to the news talk listeners what they need to know. Prior to the pandemic, and as we were just discussing off air, in her role as technology correspondent, Jess has had the opportunity to travel to and report from most of the major global tech conferences. In addition to news talk, uh, Jess also imparts her expertise to television audiences on Virgin Media One's news schedules, as well as contributing regularly to many national publications. As if that wasn't enough, in her spare time, Jess is also a very experienced MC, hosting the Dublin Tech Summit in 2018 and 2019, as well as hosting events for Career Zoo, Brain for Business, and many more. Jess, thanks so much for being with us today. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Seamus. Um, that all sounds lovely, but in the last year, I've basically been sat at home watching Netflix, so we can add that to my resume as well, maybe for next year. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this discussion. It has been a brilliant day here at Atlantic, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to facilitate this discussion today, because as you heard Seamus mention there, we have some brilliant talent on this panel who are going to share their stories, uh, some words of wisdom, and also answer that you have. So do use that Q&A box, get involved in the chat. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. We also do have some Slido polls as well. So keep your phone handy because there's a little QR code that you can scan in a few minutes time to again, help inform and direct our conversation. Um, before we jump into the chat, we might do a bit of a still a black blind date vibe and get to know our panelists this evening. Uh, so, Dorothy, if you want to kick us off and just give us a, a bit of an introduction into who you are and what you do. Absolutely. Thanks, Jess. Uh, delighted to be here. So, yeah, I am Vice President, Managing Director and Site Lead at Rent the Runway's Galway office here. So, for those who may not be familiar with Rent the Runway, it's a company that has really pioneered the world's first sustainable uh, infinity closet as such. 
So it was co-founded in 2009, and we've disrupted the $2.4 trillion fashion industry through renting or buying designer, designer clothing, accessories, or home decor from over 700 brands for our customers based in the US. And in Ireland, we are a software R&D center. Uh, we have 10 teams working across different areas, building up some amazing in-house tech for that, that service all of our customers. So we cr we've created in-house technology to power our one-of-a-kind reverse logistics solutions. Um, my own background then is I have a total mix of the background, uh, electronic engineering graduate from NUI Galway, 20 years experience in enterprise software, tech startups, management, leadership. Um, I've worked for loads of multinationals, Google, Abbott Vascular, as well as EPAM Sy Systems, which is a publicly uh, traded company in the US. And um, I also co-founded my own startup, which was uh, running successfully internationally from Galway for about seven years. Okay, so we could do this full session just talking to you, but we <laughs> Paul Madden, you might give us a bit of an introduction as well, if that's okay. Oh yeah, thanks Jess. Um, Paul Madden is the name. I'm Director of Global Operations at Clubforce. Been with the company three years, uh, started in a, a marketing role and gradually transitioned into operations before taking on this role say, full time prior to Christmas. Um, much of my cr prior career really has been in um, marketing, especially interest in data analytics and, and a passion for sport. Uh, for people who don't know Clubforce, I'm hoping that it's a small number. Um, we're a sports technology company. We provide uh, sports organizations and their people with the tools to grow and, and maximize grassroots participation in their sport. And that's through uh, managing data, communication with their membership base, uh, raising funds, etc. And um, we, we have a, a strong foothold in the Irish market, um, early, early pro uh, globally as a, as a leader in this space. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Brian, can you do the same, please? Yeah. Um, thanks, million, Jess. I suppose my name is Brian O'Rourke, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of City Swift. Um, I suppose my background is in business information systems, um, and I suppose uh, a couple of years after finishing college, we founded City Swift. Myself and one of my best friends from school, who had a kind of a, a background in the domain and in the business through his family business. Um, I suppose what City Swift. It was a few things and we got things very wrong at the start and a couple of pivots along the way. But what it is now is it's a globally unique data platform. Uh, and basically it's it's one of its kind that is optimizing urban bus networks and urban public transport networks. Um, so we're 50 people. Uh, everything has been built and, and uh, built from Galway. Um, and I suppose we're, we're working currently in kind of cities, most of the cities, the major cities across the UK, London, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, uh, and just starting to branch out into to North America and Europe now as well. Okay, brilliant. And then finally, Rory. Thanks very much, Jess, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rory Conroy. I'm the site lead for Diligent in Galway. Um, I made the uh, I suppose exciting or crazy uh, decision, depends how you look at it, uh, to uh, change jobs during the pandemic. Joint Intelligent had started this year uh, just on the back of Diligent announcing uh, their arrival into the Irish and the Galway market uh, with a, a commitment of 200 jobs uh, over the next 12 months, which were thankfully well on our way um, to achieve and based on the, the talent we have here in the West. Um, for Diligent, for those that, that don't know uh, about Diligent, we um, uh, support uh, leaders and uh, boards to make better decisions, essentially, uh, by leveraging data, insights and collaboration tools. Um, we are the largest uh, governance, risk and compliance uh, SaaS provider in the world um, and uh, certainly um, enjoying everything about uh, our setup in Galway and, and what we have in the future. My background then is I was based in Dublin for years um, started off in media, not on the, the mic side like Jess, more so on the sales and marketing side um, with 98 FM and Spin and spent some time in Google as well, similar to Dorothy. Um, and then I got into the startup space uh, with a retargeting startup called Adroll um, before the pull of the West uh, was too strong and I relocated back with my young family in uh, end of 2015 and took up a site lead role in SiteMinder uh, where I was happily up until I had my head turned by diligent. Brilliant. Okay, so that is uh, who you're going to be hearing from over the next hour. And the focus of this talk is very much about driving your business during a pandemic. There is no dummy side to, there is 
know how to manual. This is very much a case of learning on the fly. And uh, we have our first Slido poll, which will appear on the screen now. And it would be great if you could take part and just tell us a little bit about your own story. So did the pandemic cause your company to change their product strategy? This is a question that we're going to put to the panel in a few minutes time, but it would be great to get uh, input for you from you. And again, that Q&A box in the chat box is on uh, the bottom of your screen if you do want to get involved. Dorothy, I might start with you if that's OK, because what's really interesting is everybody on this panel, all of our industries have been impacted. All of our individual businesses have been impacted, and it's quite unique to have everybody go through the same thing at the one time. In terms of Rent the Runway, it's a fashion business. I don't know about your friends, but all of my friends have been living in PJs for the last 12 months. So I'm assuming, you know, fashion probably wasn't front and center. What did, what was the, the initial response from Rent the Runway in terms of the, the service that is out there for consumers? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Jess. I think when everybody went into lockdown globally, it affected so many businesses and Rent the Runway was no exception to that. Um, so ultimately, you know, everybody, no, nobody was leaving their homes. So there was no, never really a reason to go and rent a dress for a specific occasion. Now, in recent years, we've also expanded into workwear and just regular clothing wear. But as people weren't really, you know, leaving their apartments or their their homes, then that wasn't really like a great business case. So what we did is we we acted quite quickly and we we started to look at how can we reduce some of our operational costs. We looked at every all of our supplier contracts and, and looked really to see how we could essentially reduce everything that we were spending in order to sustain the business long term. So we were we started thinking like way beyond COVID because ultimately none of us knew if we were going to be in doing this COVID thing at the time, which was so brand new for like two months. Would it be two years? or even longer. So in addition to really looking to see how best we could reduce our operational expenditure, we also raised some funding. And we, we finished a, a particularly large fundraise as well, which was a great way to really ensure the financial stability of the business. So I think that's the first kind of step we really took to really, to really try and, and solidify what we were doing, to really batten down the hatches, to make sure that we were looking after our, our people and essentially our business long-term. That's really interesting. So you you managed to raise funding at a time when everybody was in flux. That that must give a good sense of uh, security in terms of belief in the product and the service that you deliver. Absolutely. So Rent the Runway is about twelve years old, and we've raised quite a lot of funding in those twelve years. And I I think having rate or raising around in the middle of a pandemic really showed the confidence that our investors have in the business um, where they, they they followed with further investment. We continued to grow throughout the pandemic um, in, you know, we did we did pause for a little while what we were doing and making sure that we had a really strong strategy coming out of it. But ultimately, we resumed all of our hiring efforts. We continued to hire in Galway. I think we onboarded like 22 or 24 people during, like like remotely during the pandemic. Um, so we we just took a moment to kind of take a breath and go, OK, what can we do here to really secure the, the future of the business? And, and fundraising was part of that. I want to come back to the point on hiring during a, during a pandemic. And Rory, you mentioned that you've changed careers during a pandemic. So we'll absolutely come back to that. But Brian, sticking on the, the, the first question of, you know, pivoting as a result of the pandemic or adapting to this new normal, as we're being forced to call it. Um, what were some of the first steps that City Swift decided to take to firstly protect the safety of the staff, but also ensure the business can continue? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, look, I think for, for a bit of background, kind of we went into the pandemic and, and you know, uh, the later part of 2019 and the early part of 2020. Um, and, you know, as an early stage uh, venture capital backed uh, a startup, you know, with big growth plans um, and things were starting to come together with a lot of integrations done. Uh, a lot of kind of pilot contracts signed with various clients and whatnot. Um, and we were hoping for, for a, I suppose, a massive Whopper 2020 uh, and hit all our targets and grow from there. I think the, the one interesting piece in, in the middle of it, um, we were in the middle of a, a funding round as well. So it was actually due to close on the 31st of March and everything was lining up. Uh, and um, I suppose it was going suspiciously well, um, which is always something to be worried about. But then 
I actually remember I spent a lot of my time pre-pandemic uh, over in the UK meeting clients and 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 doing the various clients meetings. So over and back in Ryanair flights most week. Um, and I remember flying back in, in March and early March and uh, the airport, people were going the other way to go to Cheltenham and we were flying back in. And I think it was at that point that we realised really what was going on um, and also that we probably wouldn't be flying again for a period of time. I didn't think I still wouldn't have, have had a flight by this stage, but um, that's how it's transpired. I think look, the initial thing was around and it was coming home from the UK that time after them couple of clients meetings was you know the staff the team members um and you know it, i suppose it, evacuating the office for, for for want of a better word um and look we did that and it was all about you know laptops equipment making sure people could be productive and safe and work from home um, and that was the, uh, kind of the, the first piece of, of of the problem i suppose um i think you know what came next i suppose was more of a commercial and more of a business problem in that uh a number of our clients or all of our clients are the bus companies who operate the buses in all the major cities around the UK and pretty much overnight when lockdowns were were, were launched um, they lost 90% of their passengers so that's 90% of their revenue um, and that was basically gone um, and you know for us in the middle of an investment round there were some very interesting conversations that were had with our um, existing investors and prospective future investors as well around what is going to happen to the bus industry um, and with no passengers I suppose we as a company got together um, and had our, our virtual town halls and, and got all the brains that we had together and we went and tried to look from first principles um, you know what's going on here try and you know take away the noise what do we have? What can we do? And how can we help, help our clients get through this? And I suppose the big thing that we had was we had integrations into all the data. We knew what was going on. Um, so we started analyzing and looking at the data as the data company should. Um, and it was very much in kind of coming on to the next question. It was looking to change our product strategy and change bits and pieces of that. But I think the one kind of really key interesting piece and the interesting insight that people will get was uh, most of the bus companies had reduced their services in Dublin and, and everywhere else to Sunday bus services. So buses were, were, were running what they would on a normal Sunday schedule, but they were doing that every day of the week. We noticed a big problem. Uh, and that was that, you know, there was still 10% of people using uh, using public transport and using buses. And where were these 10% of people going from and to? What were they doing? And what we found was that they were mostly essential workers traveling to and from hospitals. Um, and they were all traveling at the same times when ship work was going on and there wasn't nearly enough supply of vehicles uh, to put out for them. So I think the big thing that we did there was, you know, we informed the bus companies, we put on more supply and then people could travel safely to and from uh, their workplaces and hospitals and everything else that was going on. And I suppose, you know, we had all this technology and we built up for the last couple of years, but we, we changed from pivoted from yeah, something you know, to save a couple of euros and save inefficiencies and make buses more reliable too. It was health and safety of, of essential workers. And, you know, I think that was critically important and allowed us to kind of build and grow from there. Um, and luckily, I suppose, you know, with that and with some of the other products that we've built out, um, one around social distance and that came from all that data and information and predicting when buses were going to be full, um, it allowed us to get the investment round closed uh, to build on new products. And it was actually a big growth spurt for the business and a big surprise that, you know, with all this going on, especially in the industry we were in, uh, that we could actually grow so fast coming through it which look, there was lots of other problems around hiring and getting resources in and, and remotely that we'll probably touch on later as well. But I think, you know, how it all accumulated, I suppose, with them different pieces was, uh, I think at the end of last year, we won the Technology Innovation of the Year Award that I think you actually presented to us virtually as well, which was a pity we couldn't do it in person. But, um, you know, that was the kind of type of, of, of things that we, we did during the pandemic. And look, I have to hand it to each and every single one of the member of the team that we had, because they really went to the, to the well for, for the company. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, of long and hard days and, and a lot of new stuff that had to go on. But I think when we initially went out and planned, you know, to, to build the technology, to do the analysis and deliver for our clients, um, they were really up for it. I think at the time it was good to have a distraction to keep busy uh, and then to deliver and uh, look, it's, it's, it's put us in good shape to grow going forward. Yeah, and it's great to hear the value of the data set because, you know, sometimes when we talk about big data, it can be quite abstract, but that is a solid example of how having this data was so beneficial. And I'd say a lot of companies around the country 
were tapping into their data sets that maybe they didn't fully optimize before now, but it was a vital source of information in terms of consumer habits and, you know, helping predict that. Paul, um, we have to remember this all happened here in Ireland in March last year. It's never great when a spanner is thrown into the works in Q1 of uh, any year, but was that difficult from a financial point of view to make projections and to make savings and all the rest, particularly when we were told initially we need to go lockdown for two weeks? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's interesting listening to uh, Dorothy and, and Brian. There's a lot of parallels in the Club Force story as well. Um, and, and that unknown period, Jess, at the start was um, it, it was a scary time in a way, you know, I, I know that the initial um, uh, lockdown was for only two weeks, but there was still an unknown beyond that. And, and I suppose we couldn't anticipate uh, how long it ran on for Brian mentioned that he didn't expect not to see an airplane again or the inside of one, at least for, for a full year later and beyond. Um, like Dorothy mentioned the, the, the need to adjust quickly. Um, from, from our point of view, we noticed there was uh, a shift in, in say, normal behaviour from around um, mid-February. Uh, sport has two peak season, uh, seasons in Ireland. There's January and there's then the school year in September. And January is very much the kickoff of the GAA season and members, parents are busy registering their kids so that they can resume play in, in March. And, and all was normal, I suppose, until mid-February. And then I suppose people started to get a sense that something something was uh, going on and then there was a gradual decline and we noticed from I'd say about the week before Paddy's Day there was just a, a, a cliff fall in terms of the, the transactions through our system so the data did inform a lot of uh, what we knew or what we were learning at the time and it was um, it was a wake-up call I suppose and, and there was a need to adjust um, a, a lot of uh, club revenue and, and the ability to pay bills comes from the member base, you know, it comes from parents paying two and three memberships for their kids at their local GA club. But the clubs have bills throughout the year. Uh, the, the volunteers have a huge responsibility and, and shoulder more and more responsibility through regulation and uh, financial transparency, stuff like that. So while sport wasn't happening, uh, the running of the club still had to happen, you know, uh, pitches still needed to be mowed. Uh, clubhouses need to, needed to be maintained and, and paid for, electricity bills, affiliation bills were still coming in. So for us, it was a case of um, kind of back to basics, similar to, to what Brian was saying, that we, we kind of just uh, sat down as a, as a management team and, and said, OK, how can we make life easy for the volunteers over the course of the next few weeks, uh, anticipating it to be weeks at the time? And the, the big thing we, really was uh, fundraising and, and user engagement. So if, if you're not from Ireland, uh, the club lotto might be a, an alien concept, but it's, it's a hugely important piece of uh, fundraising for sports clubs right around the island of Ireland. And, and it's, uh, it's, an, it's an engagement piece as well. It's, it's a community uh, initiative. You know, most of it uh, would take place in, in bars around Ireland. It could be a Friday or, or Saturday evening, Monday evening, Tuesday evening. And a cohort would come together and, and uh, socialise around the club lotto, you know, and, and that was gone. And I suppose a lot of that engagement just disappeared with the pandemic. So uh, that, that initial kind of cliff fall in terms of uh, transactions and, and data run through our system uh, was something that we needed to address. Our, our priorities, I suppose, as a business were around uh, people, um, ensuring that we retained everybody that was on our team that was quickly decided as the absolute uh, priority um, and, and serving the um, the customer base as best we could then was was the, the next focus. So uh, through constant engagement really over the course of, I, I would say, a six week period, we gradually kind of found a little bit of mo momentum. Um, the, the origins of the Club Force product are in a, a product called Local Lotto, which runs back to uh, 10 years ago, probably slightly more than 10 years ago. So it was a case of back to basics, knowing what we knew best was helping clubs to, to raise funds. And we, we found that that momentum kind of uh, sustained us over a, a period of say two, three months and allowed us to kind of get uh, a, a bit of uh, stability and, and certainty back into uh, how we were reporting our business. But um, fundraising was almost, um, had almost gone into the rear view mirror as a focus for, for Club Force because there was such a focus on, on data, um, member data, membership management, um, 
uh, document management, communicating with volunteers, volunteers communicating with the member base. Um, but by by refocusing on the fundraising effort, we actually grew it uh, tenfold. I think that the two Collison brothers from Stripe said at the time that um, years worth of, of transition to online payments was compressed into several weeks. And we benefited from that significantly. I, I think um, by, by say June, July, we were on a, a, a very kind of uh, stable footing and, and it allowed us to kind of uh, springboard really and, and be prepared for the return to sport. And um, product innovation came with that as well, uh, the um, helping clubs with the return to play. So um, attendance tracking, uh, COVID health screen and that kind of thing was an innovation that we had to bring into our product that, that wasn't part of our original product roadmap. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the data started us off um, and I think um, our, our, uh, our roots helped us to kind of, um, yeah, just bring that stability back to what we were doing. Rory, you'll know your time, you mentioned that you worked in sort of the sales side of things in radio, for example, everything just stopped like I know from my job in news talk we were down to like 30 second ads on some hours whereas normally it could be four and a half minutes which just gives you an idea of the fact that people stopped advertising people didn't know what to what message to be putting out there to consumers because you couldn't say come to our showroom and test drive our cars or book yourself a weekend away that intense period and it was probably a two-month period of intense intense uncertainty definitely will have impacted businesses of all shapes and sizes around the country, wouldn't it really? Yeah, absolutely, Jess. I think, you know, Paul described it quite well as been a, a scary time. It, it certainly was, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I made the move during a pandemic. So I, I was uh, working for SiteMinder, a software um, technology company for um, for the hospitality industry. And I think there's a a myth out there that all technology companies seem to weather the storm of the pandemic, certainly being um, exclusively focused on the hospitality sector as, as SiteMinder is. Um, we were certainly in the eye of the storm um, going through um, particularly those early months. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the very positive piece that I saw come out of that was, you know, I think often some companies as they scale and grow and have offices in all different countries, you know, sometimes departments can become quite siloed. Um, and what I found going through particularly the the, the, the arm wrestle and the, the pain of those first couple of months of figuring what the hell is going on and how long is this going to last? And Leo said it'd only be two weeks and now it's two months and what are we going to do next? Um, I think, you know, what I really found was that, that you know, first in, in SiteMinder at the time, at least, it forced us to take a step back and to really, really think about our customer journey, what the customer is experiencing, both, you know, from a personal perspective as well as a professional perspective. Um, you know, we, we stopped cold calling for an, an outbound calling full stop for three weeks uh, until we actually redesigned how we go to market full stop. So we lined up our messaging, you know, directly behind as a sales organization from our marketing messaging. And, you know, that message and, 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 and hope for so long has been bandied around of sales and marketing working in unison and it all kind of, uh, and, and, and all working uh, succinctly together. I think the pandemic definitely accelerated the necessity of both of those teams to be, you know, hand in glove in terms of how they communicate to prospective customers. And we totally changed our mindset in terms of our, and, and, and retrained and recoached the entire global sales team. I was the, the head of inside sales globally at the time as well. Um, and we had an approach which was about empathy, educate and endurance, so with three E's we called it in terms of, you know, our role was to help hoteliers. If they ended up buying a product, so be it. But our goal wasn't going out there to try and shove a product down their throat and have them hand over money in a time of uncertainty. And I, I think, you know, looking back on it, um, I think we, you know, it was a very, very smart thing to do compared to perhaps some of the other players in that sector globally who continue to be quite aggressive, be it in terms of sales and or cash collections and other elements of the business that got so constricted, understandably. Um, and I think the goodwill earned during that two week period or sorry, two month period will probably last a generation with customer engagement and customer loyalty. Um, and likewise, on the flip side of if, if, if people didn't approach it in the right way, then that's, um, that, that, that's certainly, uh, I, I think a, a challenge people are going to work through and have to work through far beyond, uh, the, the next year or years ahead. 
Absolutely. Let's take a look at the Slido uh, poll results that we put up at the top of the um, of this discussion. We were asking, did you have to, I suppose, shift your product strategy to your company? And we are at 79% yes, 21% no. Uh, some of the comments that are coming in so far, uh, John O'Boyle is saying that there was a total mindset change which is really interesting to hear, but I want to pick up on something that Rory just said there. He mentioned the word empathy and Dorothy, I think that has something uh, that is one of the key words of the last 12 to 14 months, whether it's with your friends and family or your coworkers or your team or your employees, depending on what role you're in. I mean, how human focused, how employee focused, um, did your business have to become and was there a big dramatic shift or did your company culture already have that side of things nailed? Yeah, I, I have to say Rent the Runway's focus on culture has been there since day one. Um, and like I am a big believer that people are the most important thing we have, like they're the most important asset we have, be it in our personal lives or professional lives. Um, I think we we learned to lead more with empathy, though, um, I suppose, to go into the empathy question. Um, our culture is all about people. And I, you know, when we hire, it's all about, yeah, can that person do the job? But also, are they a sound person to work with? Like, ultimately, that's what's as important, if not even more important, because you could be the smartest person in the room. But ultimately, if nobody wants to work with you, then, you know, it's not really going to work out too well. So um, I always really advocate for people leaning into the em empathetic side of, of their personality as well. And we have some amazing examples of people, including uh, New Zealand's pre president who lead with, with empathy. Um, and I think that really came to the fore during the pandemic where I really wanted us to have a lot of transparency. There were so many unknowns, be it with, you know, um, the workplace environment, be it to like how we've all, how we all had to go overnight from working 100% in the office to 100% at home. But then beyond that, there was all sorts of challenges that people were, were juggling. There were health challenges, like mental health challenges, how had to balance everything going on in your personal life. Many people, you know, their children's um, schools have been closed. So the way I was describing it is like we're used to having kind of one or two things to manage that that may be kind of slightly out of like slightly in chaos. However, pretty much overnight, everything went into chaos. And I think as a leader, you have to be empathetic and to remember people are human at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. um, they we never expected people to kind of just go on with your everyday life and make sure you're still delivering. And, you know, there's going to be trouble if you don't like we were never that type of company anyway. Uh, but I have to say, like, I I really, you know, took my lead from the people I work with as well. We have an amazing group in Galway. We have an incredible group in New York as well. And I think to see people lead and, and that's at every single level, like you don't have to be top of the organization to be a leader. Leadership mm -hmm. comes from every single role in, in the company and rent the runway. And I think being empathetic to what people are going through. And it could be just like, you know, somebody's having an off day, even post COVID, right? And I think we all have to remember that we're all human. And I think empathy is a huge, huge part of that as well. Brian, I, I'm curious how you found it because you mentioned there the, oh my days moment when the pandemic hit in terms of the business. I'm sure some of your people were worried about their jobs. They were worried about their family. They were worried about their own well being. That is when you are the head honcho, you have all these different considerations to take on board whilst also having your own stuff going on as well. Yeah, no, look, it is a really good question. And I think even around the culture and the interactions, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, a lot of City Swift would have been built around in person. So, you know, we have a, a low uh, number of high value clients who would we spend a lot of face to face time with pre-pandemic. And obviously that has to stop. And then even with our office, you know, we, we had, you know, very little re remote employees and we didn't have a remote working policy, you know, and the culture was built around meeting each other in the office, becoming friends together inside and outside of the office, doing activities, whatever it may be. Uh, and obviously, you know, that was was brought to a halt, both from, you know, a client commercial point of view, but also from, you know, a, a team point of view. And I think, you know, 
everybody says we, we shifted to remote, but it wasn't normal remote. Normal remote, you can go to a co-working space, you can visit your friends and family, you can go out for dinner, and all them things had you know stopped. So I think we were we were definitely all thrown in at the deep end. I think look fr from our perspective as a company, there obviously was a lot going on um, as a startup, and and you know, but we were also in a, in a lucky position in that. You know, we did, you know, compared to say non venture backed companies and whatnot, we did have significant cash reserves even at that time. And we had runway to do is for, you know, many, many numbers of months, double digit months ahead. So, and I suppose initially when we went into the pandemic, we thought it was going to be three or four weeks. So I think, you know, for us, it was very much from day one and i think the mindset and the attitude from everybody in the team and i think that's why people join the startup as well and it was that how do we grow how do we come out of this better you know what are we going to do that when this is over that the, the, the company is going to be twice the size as it was and that was really the mindset shift that i took and i think that all the team took and it came from bottom up and, and to drive the business forward and look thankfully you know it did work out even with the extended lockdowns and whatnot it did work out that you know we're coming even out of the pandemic hopefully fingers crossed very soon uh more than twice the size that we went into it um but it, it look you know it was and i i think the remote aspects have been really interesting um and you know for, for us as a company to do as well because we probably would have if if the pandemic had not have happened i'm not sure we would have you know been so open to remote uh, i think we would have probably tried to 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 keep that kind of in person whether it be clients the team members everything in galway and what's mm -hmm. transpired since is we've been able to employ people you know they're living all all across ireland uh, they're looking forward to getting to galway for weekends and, and and workshops and training and coming to the hq and whatnot uh you know once every month a couple of times a quarter and, and all of this but it's really opened up the talent pool um and you know i think it has probably allowed us to grow by by this remote and this this new culture and these new policies that we brought in has, has allowed us to grow as quick as we have. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's you know the old saying is trying to to turn opportunities, to turn a crisis into opportunities, and make the best of a bad situation. Um, and I think you know for any business, especially a young business, you know we've gone through a lot of adversity even before COVID and before the pandemic. Um, and it's all about trying to just grow grow through that uh, and you know and look high growth companies it is very hard there's always going to be challenges but i think the people and definitely the talent that's joined us that's what they wanted they wanted the challenges um and thankfully we've, we've come through it stronger well that leads me nicely into a question that we have in the chat box from rachel kavanagh i'm going to put this to the entire panel because i think it's a nice one uh, she says, I would particularly like to hear about the surprise successes during the pandemic, because it's not all been doom and gloom. I do think that there have been elements of silver lining. Um, I might start with you on that one, Paul. So what would you say were some of the surprise successes? Surprise success, I, I think I, I mentioned it earlier on, touched on it earlier on, um, the, um, the club Lotto and, and the growth of that as a, a fundraiser for clubs uh, was enormous um on average prior to the pandemic i think the peak we would have reached was eight thousand eight thousand lottery tickets across the clubs per month um and that acceleration that i mentioned the stripe brothers uh the collison brothers at stripe mentioned that uh the the, the acceleration to online payments it it, it was uh probably over may june july that that started to really uh, ramp up and when i said there was a the fall off a cliff. There was a steady climb back up the cliff again uh, in uh, kind of mid July, and it's just gone and taken legs. You know, it's grown and grown and grown, and it continues to grow. And um, both the the um, the real benefit in it for the club is that um, when people play the the lotto through the club four system, it, um, it generally speaking, about fifty five percent of them choose to auto renew their tickets. So it's this recurring revenue for the clubs that. Uh, doesn't require man hours from the volunteers, you know, and, and we're up past, I think it's 105,000 uh, tickets per month now. So it's it's like a 12 fold increase in the number of tickets that we're selling. So that's been a huge uh, boost to, to Club Force, um, it, like from a, a business perspective in terms of um, cash flow that I suppose we hadn't anticipated. We were focused on other areas of the business and trying to internationalize. Um, the, the business and, and focusing on growing into the UK and this came as a, a bit of a surprise but again it kind of um, 
it reminded us of, of some of the things that we were very good at and, and going back over 10 years, you know, helping clubs to raise funds, uh, vital funds, um, without the effort, without the, 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 the trudge of going around selling, selling tickets or, or with a bucket outside the, the supermarket and trying to get small amounts of money in. Um, huge, huge effort in terms of man hours to try and do that offline. And, mm -hmm. and that's definitely been a, a pandemic bonus for, for Club Force. Rory, I'd say you're uh, <laughs> managing to get a job that you love uh, during a pandemic, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely surprised for my uh, wife, who's a lifelong accountant and risk averse at the best of times. But uh, <laughs> no, listen, it, you know, you know, interestingly, I, I, I met with um, the diligent team who are doing the, the recce around Europe and when the final stops was Galway and, um, the, you know, literally the week before we had the lockdown um, and I was able to, I suppose, keep that, keep those connections and, and that relationship going. Um, and I think for me, just, you know, in, in terms of their, their ambition to grow and back the West and back it across so many different departments. Um, for me, got me super fired up. I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to do some lecturing in NUIG as well, and, you know, the 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 level of talent um, and ambition that's coming, you know, through our third level systems is, at you know, was a big piece that really made me kind of take a step back. Um, and I think if you're not exposed to it, you don't appreciate just how clever, sharp, and able. Um, I think you know so many of our graduates and, you know, so-called younger uh, individuals or less tenured individuals are, and I think if you're looking through the pandemic, I think. I think you know certainly I saw and 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 Dorothy mentioned mentioned it earlier in terms of leaders aren't just from the top they're right across the organisation. I think one of the great surprises has been just you know how people have stood up right across organisations, uh, regardless of how much experience you have, and have actually come to the fore in terms of helping to to to, to you know to, to help you know the companies and people get through what is you know hopefully a once in a lifetime experience that we that we we've, we've gone through over the last while and are still going through and. I think that is probably one of the, the great surprises has been around, I guess, that sense of community within the company and the fact that, you know, if, if, if you're constantly waiting for the CEO or C-level to tell you what to do and how to feel, um, you know, that's much easier to, 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 to kind of to, to engender when you're in person uh, and, you know, doing a town hall and the body language and everything that goes with that. Um, but yeah, one of the big surprises for me is, 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 is genuinely the, the way that people have stood up and understanding the personal challenges that they're going through and connecting with other people in companies and, and wider field as to, um, you know, that we're in it together and we'll come out of it together and a real kind of dogged determination to come out the other end. And listen, Dorothy also mentioned there just, you know, you know, mental health and, and the impact that's had on, I think all of us in different ways, either consciously or subconsciously. And, you know, that slack or that, you know, message or that text or that, call out on a call that you know was was from someone uh, that you know over the last number of months is the difference between you know people you know feeling a little bit more comfortable about things and not so i think the success overall has been the way that i think people have stood up i think the trust that we have and should have in our less tenured uh, individuals that we have in organizations who are ambitious who are smart or are, are driven and really are the future leaders and we need to um, empower them and give them a platform to be successful um, in, 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 in the organizations we work in. So that's probably one of, the, one of the things that surprised me and really kind of, I suppose, enthused me and about the future full stop. Yeah, I think we, we had a panel discussion yesterday about digital transformation, but one of the things that came up was Yes, digital is going to be a huge driver, but so too are the soft skills. And I hate that they're called soft skills because they're almost devalued a little bit, but they are so important. Dorothy, you mentioned that you guys are obviously based in Galway, but you have offices elsewhere. How important is it and how doable is it to maintain that human connection and build that company culture and have people feel like Working, they're all rowing in the same direction, regardless of whether you're in the same room or a different continent. Yeah, I think there's there's two real avenues I could go down to answer that question. I think it it also ties into your previous question about um, a success, right? So mm -hmm. while all of us are totally 
um, you know, we're all a bit tired of Zoom and, you know, WebEx or, or whatever it is. We all have our like boxes that we're in. The upside has been it's actually kind of leveled the playing field when we're 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 working with another office. So while if I, if I was in the New York office, you bump into people, you go for coffee, you go for a drink after work, you go for, for dinner and, and you're able to build those relationships. And then when you go back on the plane home again, it's like, oh, like, you know, you don't get that kind of connection as such and then you end up doing another trip and it's great again but i think with with covid like the upside is probably the only upside has been like ultimately everybody is in exactly the same mode so we all have an opportunity to connect one on one albeit in a two dimensional way um so i think that has been definitely like an, an upside and it's also helped to build those those relationships um and then when i look at kind of across the organization and in our Galway office specifically I think it comes back to the leading with transparency and just having really open conversations. Um, I love when people connect one to one, like be it, you know, offline or, or online um, anyway during COVID or, or outside of COVID, obviously only when it's safe to do so. So I think, you know, putting time into building relationships is incredibly important because you know, you might not work with somebody today, but ultimately you could work with somebody in the future, be it on a different team, or maybe you'll progress in, in your role. And actually just today, um, it's one of the reasons I, I started this like women in Galway group and we had our first meeting today and it was amazing. And it's really about like women empowering women and people empowering each other to really lift each other up. And I think that's something that can be done in person or over a video conference. And I help, I think it helps to build that culture. And ultimately, I think it comes down to trust and trusting the people that you work with, because if you trust the people that you work with, they will enable themselves to deliver on time, to raise awareness over any struggles that they're having, having be it professional or, or personal, to give people the space to actually do their jobs and not have to kind of check in on them all the time. I think when you give people an opportunity, nine, nine times out of 10, they will step up and, and do the job that they have put their hand up to do. Brian, have you found that people are more than happy to step up and be the leader, as somebody mentioned earlier on, and also kind of be an advocate for themselves as well? If they do need that day off or if they just need a little bit of slack, it seems to me, as I understand it, that there is a bit more openness in certain organisations. Now, not all organisations, but in certain organisations, it has kind of sped up that process of just having better communication. Yeah, no, I definitely think so. And I think, you know, some of the points that, that, that Rory and Dorothy have, have mentioned, you know, around the trust, the helping each other, having the empathy um, and like definitely what I found and, you know, over the years, the more you trust people, the more you give them flexibility, the more room you give them, they give it back to you in bucket loads. Um, and I think if you're there trying to be the, the dictator or the autocratic and nine to five and this and that and, you know, really micromanaging, it doesn't work. And people, you know, the best people don't like that. The best people can manage themselves. The best people can drive forward. And, you know, whatever it is, if there's something going on in their personal lives, if you give people room, give people space, they will come back and deliver and deliver and deliver over again. And I think, you know, it's it's an investment in, in people and it's also they're investing in the company and it's to trust in each other. I think 100%, I think, you know, um, over the last 12 months, especially, you know, when you're going through rapid growth, you know, virtually, albeit there's been a couple of things. I think, you know, we've had to, to and I think it's probably one of the biggest mistakes we made in the early stages. We stopped hiring. We stopped bringing in people into the business, which then the growth came very, very quick after that and left us very, very short on resources. Um, and, you know, there was major challenges that had to go on there. And I think, you know, it was one of the points that Rory said uh, around the, the, the talent of the graduates and the talent of the, the younger um, people, I suppose, coming out of the universities. We were very, very, very lucky that in, you know, June time of last year, the big corporations, you know, the, the, the accountancy firms and whatnot were reneging on some of these internships and graduate positions. And I suppose, you know, we were in that, in that we had massive, massive resource issues. So I suppose it was kind of like a little perfect storm for us, whereby we were able to get the best of talent that were coming out of universities and, you know, the, the top couple of percent, um, you know, people who, who got grades far, far, far above whatever I did when I was in college. Um, and look, they joined the business and they hit the ground running. 
But the amount of responsibility they were able to take on, the amount they were able to deliver within a couple of weeks of starting, and it really did transform and I suppose power our growth forward um, for you know the last 12 months that, it, that, that everything that has happened. And I think within that, and it probably does deserve a shout out as well, is the we went into to, to the to COVID in March 2020. I think we had 15 employees. Um, they were all say some were very experienced, some had mid level of experience, um, but you know only a small number of them say had a previous people management experience, previous leadership experience, and whatnot. But obviously, when we we brought in so much young workforce into the business, we had all of our existing workforce who then pretty much overnight, remotely, not in person, um, with with you know little training, I suppose, uh, were were given a, a management role or a mentorship role or whatnot. And to be honest, they also delivered and they took the graduates under their wing, they brought together and it was like a mentorship. And, and time and time again, and we've done our EMPS surveys recently in the last couple of quarters, and without a doubt, the thing that stands out the most and comes back in 95% of all the positive feedback is the people within the business. It's it's the people that they're working with on a daily basis, the mentors um, and the people on their teams and everybody working together. And I think it was something that, that you know, has been said already, but the whole in it together, everyone driving forward and, you know, I suppose going through a once in a lifetime thing, you're you're making friends for life as well. Going through these these challenges and coming out the other side and being successful and being on a mission. And you know, I think look, the one thing for me with all of this going on was I was very thankful that I did have work and I did have a, a you know a mission and and something that you know you could you could um, put your mind to, I suppose. Uh, and it probably did make it easier just to drive forward. Um, but yeah, that was I suppose the pieces for us and whatnot. We um we have heard that Rory uh, moved job during the pandemic. If any of you have moved jobs, pop it into this chat uh, window. I'd love to hear your experience. Was it smooth sailing? Were you hiring during the pandemic? How did that process go? Were there any teething issues? Did you find some people gelled better than others? Uh, do let us know in the chat. Um, I think we have another Slido poll here. Uh, and the question is, what would be your primary concern in changing jobs during a pandemic? So was it the remote onboarding, uncertainty about job security as a new employee, future work from home policy after COVID, you'd have no concerns or other. And if you are somebody who's in the other category, do let us know. Um, Rory, in terms of being a new starter during a pandemic, it's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. We did a series on New Talk called Future of Work, and we were talking about how, you know, interview the traditional interview process is somebody comes in, they shake the hand, the interview panel, you spend a bit of time making small talk, you get a vibe off the person, and then you get down to business. Obviously, that wasn't possible during the pandemic. So, as somebody who went through that process, how did you find it and how did it differ to the, the traditional way of doing things? Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's been transformed dramatically. And I, I think I suppose if we look at the, the story in Diligent, we've since announcing our arrival in, in November, we've hired 150 people in Galway all remotely who are you know recruited, onboarded, trained and coaching. So we've had to take a, a major step back um, because traditional methods obviously aren't going to cut it. Uh, in terms of uh, making people feel uh, a certain way and and uh, being able to 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 ramp individuals into an organisation, both culturally and uh, functionally, um, so I guess from our perspective, we we took a step back. We were able to work with a, a consultancy firm that kind of specialised in um, employee experiences, and again, you know, whether it's a consultancy firm or not, um, it, 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 it helped us kind of, I suppose, stay on point in terms of what we wanted to achieve, which was to redesign that pre-start and that onboarding experience. So, you know, we, we spent a lot of time speaking to people who've been onboarded recently, um, people who've been with the business quite a while, obviously looking at best practices uh, in other companies and countries. And, you know, we, 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 we totally redesigned that candidate experience on the back of that, uh, whereby from a recruitment perspective, you know that gut feel, and you know I think gut feel is is, is the piece that has has definitely um, uh, needs to be uh, kind of uh, re-educated. Is more data driven now than ever before, but I think that gut feel of a candidate is is uh, a little bit compromised without the, the the social cues of body language and or 
just the unsaid and the chemistry and all of those things that go into kind of making make, making making the decision of who joins a company. And I think you know we, we we've needed to become much more meticulous about the type of interview questions and areas that you, in the nicest possible way, interrogate a, a candidate on because. You know, it's been bandied about quite a bit in this call, but it's it's not flippant that you know mm -hmm. y y your culture and your people are the most important things, and you need to ensure that people are joining a business for the right reasons uh, for the company, but also for themselves. And you know, sometimes if you get a no to an interview, it doesn't mean you know that 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 you know you, you did a a terrible interview or you're you're not going to do a good interview in the future. It's just not a right fit. Um, and, you know, that's the piece where I think, you know, we put a huge amount of emphasis is in terms of the panel, you know, the interview panels that we put together, the type of questions that we, um, we, 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 we came at in terms of really trying to make an educated decision um, remotely. Was this person the right fit? And once we made that decision, then I think it's really rethinking about how a person experiences the week before and the first week coming into the business, mm -hmm. like starting any job at the best of times is a nerve wracking experience, no matter how, you know, ex experienced any of us are. Um, it's, it's, it's really nerve wracking. And, you know, I, I used to suffer particularly from nerves, particularly as a kid, uh, you know, to a, a very, a, a very detrimental level. And, and it's still there um, and comes out from time to time. Um, and I'm very conscious of that with people coming into the organization. So we need to think and diligent, okay, how are we going to make people feel comfortable? How are we going to make them feel welcome and connected with the company and with new starters that they can't be around? So, you know, we, we went through a, a whole series of, um, I suppose, mapping out that week prior where we ensure that people have a welcome kit. They are receiving communication from the chief people officer. They're getting insights in terms of the company in advance. They're able to listen to some podcasts about the company, especially designed for them in advance. Um, and their manager is engaging with them and asking for some insight about who they are and what they like. And, you know, those type of get to know you type of information pieces we solicited in advance. And then, you know, on the week of, which is a kind of a redesign kind of week one we've put in place, we've put a whole, I suppose, multimedia experience where people are learning through group work in particular. So we break everyone up into different cohorts. And uh, so smaller groups of four to five uh, in terms of folks that we're bringing in, they work through different tasks and different exercises as a smaller team every day um, and um, we also have podcasts that are kind of special messages that are delivered from our executive team we have a, our ceo does a welcome every monday afternoon for all new starters and spends 20 minutes to 30 minutes talking to them asking them any questions taking any questions asking them you know about themselves um, you know we've introduced product and um, and business simulation so people really start to feel what a customer experience is working for us kind of in our line of business obviously we, we deal you know very exclusively with boards and executives so you know being able to simulate kind of crisis situations and for our new starters to be thrust into that on day three as a member of that executive fictional kind of scenario and how they would handle it and being able to use our products and all of these things to be able to uh, work through those type of situations um and and obviously then ensuring that you know from a body perspective they have a dedicated body so you just you're rethinking all the touch points and yeah you know i think it was mentioned earlier in this call like you can have screen fatigue going from screen to screen to screen so it's really important to introduce diversity to that experience and i think certainly from an onboarding experience and recruitment experience it needs to have engagement it needs to be diverse you need to get people fired up and excited and again, you know, every week we, we, we do our onboarding, we, we, uh, we, we, we take a survey of how people experienced every step of the way, and then we iterate and we adapt for the following cohort that we bring on to ensure that we're holding ourselves to task and, and that that experience is optimized to the best it possibly can. Yeah, Dorothy, it's interesting that the focus that has been placed on human resources and having good HR practices, um, because not only does that impact the, the new people incoming to the company, but also your staff. Like it's not enough to send around a funny GIF in a Slack message and think that's going to boost morale. There's so much more to it. And I do think that investing in things like um, human resource, whether it is software solutions, whether it is, you know, a food voucher, whatever, it is important to keep the morale up, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. I I couldn't agree more. We've had to be extremely creative with, you know, coming up with, you know, fun ideas to get people together to make them feel valued outside of, you know, your regular work meetings. 
so we've had to think very, you know, carefully about what can we do? What's appropriate? Not everybody feels like celebrating. People are going through a lot. You know, this is, you know, over the last, say, 14 months. But we have identified, um, you know, different points throughout the year where we would put together like a beautiful McCambridge's hamper um, and, you know, send it out to everybody as a surprise. Like we really support local businesses here in Galway. So I've, sh I've mentioned McCambridge's, but we've done Dobro's pizza boxes. We've done Handsome Burger. They all seem to be food themed. Not everyone likes alcohol. So, you know, you have to kind of balance it up. Um, and actually, it's our it was our second birthday in Galway. So Rent Runway is now two years old in Galway, which is really cool. So we we did one of these really nice boxes and sent out um, actually this mug that I have here, which is Rent the Runway's logo, and then our two year anniversary oh. logo on that. And I I think just like it doesn't have to be this huge financial investment, but you are thinking about the employee. You are thinking about what they want or what will make them feel like that extra bit special. Um, we also do uh, summer Fridays, which is basically like every Friday from one o'clock onwards during the summertime that, you know, people can log off for the, for the whole weekend and that's that. So do a few hours in the morning and off you go. Uh, we've also done extra company days, which are days that we've picked throughout the year in the calendar to say, okay, listen, you know, Friday, the 28th of, of May, it's going to be a company day. You don't need to work that day. And I think things like that are really, really important because you're really listening to what people are looking for. People find it very difficult to switch off, but encouraging people to switch off, not necessarily being online all the time is one of the big things I think we've learned during the pandemic um, that it's really important to have that type of disconnect after you finish your, your, your work for the day. Yeah, Paul, yeah. interesting point. And there's been a lot of talk about the, the right to switch. And there was the story last week about some employers potentially using software to monitor their employees' productivity. It, it comes back to trust, doesn't it, really? That if you don't have the trust in your staff, they're not going to stick around and you're not going to have a good reputation, which will cause your business damage in the long run. Yeah, it's, it's a two-way thing, the trust, I think, Jess. Um, like back to um, say the, when the pandemic first struck, I, I was interested listening to Dorothy there talking about how culture has always been kind of um, a central focus for them. It hasn't in, in reality for, for Club Force. Um, I think the pandemic, not that, not that it was a wake up call, but it, it, it kind of gave us a realization that um, the, the people within our business were, were vitally important. There was a very good organic culture kind of growing anyway. I think there's a great team spirit. and. Aside from the pandemic, I think one of the things we want to retain is that team spirit. We're, we're lucky to have a young and adaptable uh, workforce, and and they set the tone really for for how we operate as a business. And it was it was only really towards the back end of last year when we, uh, through the pandemic, I suppose, had had a rethink about the the strategy and the direction we were heading in and how we were going to achieve it. And uh, set ourselves on a slight kind of course correction more than a, a real shift in in focus, but. One of the things we did was um, put a focus on, on culture and put the culture in the hands of the employees. Um, so there's a, a group of volunteers. There's nine of them in the group. Um, we have a team of 28 people, so one, one in three and, and somebody from every department. Um, they've taken it upon themselves to set the, the culture for the business, and uh, they've created a, a, what is called a culture club, uh, if there's any Boy George fans out there. Um, <laughs> and they kind of set the tone, really. Uh, they decide. Uh, how they can influence the business in terms of uh, social events is, is one part of it, of course, but it's more about uh, how we can improve uh, business processes, work together, mind each other. Um, like the most recent thing we would have done was uh, a communal uh, darkness into light with everybody doing it from their own uh, hometown or the, the nearest place they could do it from. So uh, I, I think really everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet on, on, on this call at least, but mm. um, it's the, it's the relationship between the the company and um the the employees has to be has to be one of one of trust now the, the pandemic probably pushed us into kind of a, a leap of faith in terms of the whole working from home thing and i think um th that idea of being able to switch off is is still crucially important do we get that right all the time uh, i i wouldn't say so um and i suppose it speaks to the um the culture within the business that uh we deal with volunteers who operate out of hours. You know, people are doing this in their in their evenings and weekends, and and we've built a reputation around customer service where we're available to them, 
um, in those in those hours, you know. So um, the, there is a kind of a willingness to work outside of those hours, but it's 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 how you make it up in in other ways and, and give people the kind of the free time, the flexibility uh, to work in a way that suits them. I mean, it, doing the school runs and things like that, you know, that kind of give people the freedom to to run their work life in a way that suits them and not that kind of uh, nine to five expectation or nine to six or whatever, you know. Yeah, we have a comment here from John O'Boyle in the chat function. A quick reminder that you can get involved. We have another few minutes here. So if you do have any burning questions, pop them into the chat. And I will put them to the panel. Uh, John O'Boyle says, I uh, suggest that you make small things but need the longer term team journeys. It needs to be three to four months to execute true team change. And then going back to our Slido panel, 50% uh, of you uh, would be concerned about uncertainty about job security new employee if you were to move job during a pandemic. Brian, it's funny because as, as much as businesses want to reassure staff during a pandemic, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't, you don't, none of, I don't think any of you have a crystal ball. Like none of you can predict and be right that, you know, in three weeks time, everything's going to be grand. So how do you go about instilling that confidence uh, in your staff that everything is going to be okay? Or if it's not going to be okay, that you're not going to be chucking them under the bus? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good point. I think just look for us and since we went fully remote um, every Friday at half past four, there's a weekly update that normally I would I would chair if I'm not there, somebody else uh, will chair some of the leadership team and full transparency, you know, from everything that's going on in the business. We have four strategic pillars in the business, technology, commercial clients, um, people and financial. Um, and we would give a thorough update of each and every single one of them pillars to see what's happened in the last week. Because there's one thing people do dislike, and that's surprises. You know, if something mm -hmm. pops up out of nowhere, but where if you're honest and upfront about everything that's going on on the business in a continuous basis, um, and you're consistent about it and consistent about the messaging, and everybody's in the loop, uh, you know, it instills a sense of trust. And and I trust everybody that's in our business. Um, and look, I, I hope they then trust me and trust the leadership team. And I think, you know, there's there's other ways that that pays back. You know, like you said around job security and everything else. That's one obviously clear one. But the second is that they have all the information at their fingertips to make decisions. So if they need to make a decision about a product strategy, a new feature, hiring a certain person or this type, they have full visibility from around the business to make them decisions. And I think. What we as as you know business leaders need to do is is try and facilitate that, that that you know everybody that is working on our teams can potentially become and grow into business mm -hmm. leaders. Because if we instill that culture and instill that growth path, then you know the business is going to be unbelievably successful. And I think you know to kind of a point that you mentioned, you know, around HR and how important it is, and sometimes it, it does get forgotten. 100% pre-pandemic, we were 14 people, we were a little family, um, you know, we had so our finance manager did our HR stuff, that's the way it was, it worked, we never had any issues, brilliant. But I think, you know, and we're lucky to have a really, really strong board and a strong chairman uh, and really good help there. Uh, and, you know, during when we started to hit kind of growth spurt, um, say, you know, around this time last year, a key focus for us was to bring in, um, you know, a really, really not just a, a HR person, but a HR function within the business. Um, and we were very lucky to get in a, a, a VP, a Vice President of People in the Wees, who came from, she was a global leader in EA Sports. Um, and, you know, she joined the business and delivered so much so quickly. And I think it was just at the perfect time as well. And I think, you know, with all of, of, of you know, developing in the HR function, and we do do a good bit as well of, you know, trying to, to help out with the gifts and the small things and the hampers and the extra days holidays. But what came back an awful lot in the various service and the various different bits and pieces that we were doing uh, with all the wider staff is that, you know, one, they wanted to be listened to. They had great ideas. You know, we need to fix this process. We want to build this feature. We want to do this. We should think about doing things a different way here. And I think it was critical that, you know, I, 
allocated a certain amount of my time just to listen to all the ideas, to have the face time with the various team members and employees, no matter what level they were at. Because, you know, some of the ideas you will get from a graduate versus, you know, a manager, they're all equal in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But I think the other kind of key thing, and, and you know, you're 100% right on, on, you know, investing in people was the people through the pandemic. I think a lot of our lives kind of took a little bit of a, a standstill that, you know, you couldn't really do external things and whatnot. But everybody who was working for us, they, they wanted their careers to keep going. And, you know, this was a time where they could actually focus now more on their careers than maybe they had in previously because there wasn't a whole pile else going on in life. And it was things like, you know, what's what's the growth path? What's my growth path within the business? What's my career path? These were the questions we were getting asked. You know, what's the learning and development opportunities? You know, can we really subsidize doing some college courses for us? You know, upskilling the various new online pieces and putting in a learning and development platform. I think and giving them all the necessary resources to do that. And I think that was the stuff that really was eye opening for me, I suppose. You know, it isn't just a HR function that comes in and puts in a, you know, a, a policy here or a policy there, but it's actually allowing people to grow. And if everybody in the business is constantly growing as quick as the business is growing, then it's going to be, you know, undoubtedly a success in the future. We have another question here from Brendan Lally. And Dorothy, I might throw this one to you. Uh, what is your take on return to office compared to work from home and balance in terms of the time frame? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think there's a huge difference between actually having a work from home policy and working from home during a pandemic. The two, in my view, were completely different things. During the pandemic, we were all forced to work from home. There wasn't a choice there. Um, that we were also just, you know, forced to juggle a ton of things that was also outside of our control, uh, be it kids, be it like, you know, health, health concerns. So I think when we introduce our work from home policy, which is what we're going to do in Rent the Runway, we're actually going to have a hybrid model. So people get to pick and choose how often they want to be in the office for. So because Rent the Runway's culture is so important to us, we want to, we've encouraged people to be in the office either two or three days a week. Now, lots of people have come to me to ask, can I be in the office more often? I'm like, absolutely. If you want to be in the office like five days a week, you're more than welcome. But we want people to have that flexibility. And I think there's a great balance to be had there because I, I know the way I work and a lot of people work, it's great to have like a zone where you can completely have focus time where you've got three or four hours and you can just get a big piece of work done. Um, and then I think that paired with the, the great culture, you're meeting people, you're having a cup of coffee, but also on the more, I suppose, product productivity part, there's nothing better than getting people together and having creative sessions like brainstorming. How are we going to tackle this architectural solution for one of our microservices? And you get like lots of people in the room who are brilliant at their own jobs. And again, it comes back to trust, trusting that they will know when is the right time for them to be in the office versus, you know, when I can actually take some time and work fully from home. So I think there, there's going to be like the productivity level of all of our staff has has remained the same. People are as productive working from home as they are in the the office. It also it gives people a nice opportunity to balance the whole culture side of it, hanging out with their colleagues, getting to know people because we've onboarded, I think, as I mentioned earlier, over 20 people that have never met each other. And I think I can't wait for getting people together and just really getting to know people sitting across and having a cup of coffee, going for a drink. That's when you really get to know people. And we can simulate that virtually until that time is right, whether that's once a month, you know, once a week or or whenever. I think it's great to, again, trust the people and give them that flexibility that they need. Rory, how have you found it as somebody who has joined a company during a pandemic? Do, do you feel as bedded in or is it still a bit bizarre because it's not business as usual? Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I, I think we've had, and I've had to adapt my leadership style quite a bit coming into this role. Um, I was always a very in-person kind of leader, kind of learned from coffee chats, going for lunch, just passing on the hallway, just grabbing little nuggets of information from people. Um, and that's obviously not quite as accessible in the current environment. So I think even from my first week starting, and I've been doing it since, I, you know, I put out a, a weekly video to the whole office, just talking about, you know, what's important to the goal each side, you know, what's come down the line, um, you know, and, and it's been touched on quite a bit in this, in, in this uh, session, which is great, but, you know, I, I've, I've probably never had a unique idea of my own ever. And that's, you know, not ashamed to say that whatsoever. Um, and, you know, how we'll build a culture and we are building a culture and diligence fully remotely is by 
it being everyone's responsibility and you know i you know running you know whether surveys coffee chats optional workshops just constantly giving different touch points to have people um able to lean in and give their opinion and know that it's not just a piece of feedback that is done as a tick box exercise it actually turns into actions and actions are followed through and you close the loop on it and i think it's those type of activities that are so much more important in a remote environment whereby when people give feedback or they engage they need to see it followed through because sometimes you can see it followed through if you're in an office depending on what the topic is um but you don't have the app the, the ability to do that um when you're all fully remote so I think that's been important for me. I think listen, authenticity is probably the most attractive trait personally and professionally. And, you know, a big thing that, you know, is really important and I'm sure to the, the, the panelists here as well, but certainly within our culture and diligence is, you know, diversity and bringing your true self to the office. And you need to create an environment where people are comfortable being themselves. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's, you know, that's, that's, I guess, my role as, as the site lead is to create the right environment for what we're going through and you know what, you know what have stood me well in the past won't stand me well if i just try and copy and paste it into you know what we've gone through uh since since joining diligent over the last six months so i think we need to be nimble i think we need to rethink what culture is um and how we experience culture i think being able to you can't just transform your kind of in-office culture straight into your remote culture and do everything the same way because it just won't work um but taking your cues your advice and your engagement from the team and, and having them help set the vision help identify the values that matter most and you know to paul's point earlier you know we've got two culture clubs uh, clubs uh, i think in galway then uh, paul we've got a boy george over in, in diligent as well so um again it, it's it, it's been able to empower other individuals uh, to step up and lead those moments that matter that make it I suppose a home within a home which is what remote working is really so um mm -hmm. yeah it, it's been interesting um i listen i've learned loads and i think if you're not learning and you know you're, you're not growing and if you're not growing well then you should go off and do something totally different so you know that's you know the simplistic career advice i give to everyone is are you happy and are you learning and if the answer to any of those is no well then go do something about it if the answer to both is no and you can't do anything about it go off and do something else so I think we've learned a huge amount over the last 12 months. I think we've probably had nearly a lifetime of experiences crammed into um, the last, you know, since the pandemic has began. But I think personally and professionally, you know, we've grown and we've gotten through it and we'll continue to get through it, um, notwithstanding all the the, 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 the the tough situations that have happened along the way. So I think you learn from the good times and the bad times and you just keep pivoting, keep evolving, um, keep diversifying what you do and, Make sure you create an environment where people can bring their true self to the office. Yeah, that's a really good uh, piece of advice. That's a nice little nugget. I hope everybody was paying attention during that. And if you didn't catch all of it, uh, this video will be available next week. And I think that is a good message to take. Uh, we started with our little round table of who you are and what you do. I'm going to do the same thing again and ask you all for a key takeaway for people watching this session today because. I think we've covered a lot. There's a whole lot of stuff that we could do if we had another two hours. Um, but Paul, what would be your key takeaway for, for people watching this today? I, I think it's keep the faith, Jess. Um, like the, the pandemic has been um, intense and has brought a different intensity to every every work in life. Like hearing uh, Dorothy talk there about um, the difference between uh, a work from home policy in the pandemic versus outside of the pandemic. I think one of the good things is that the pandemic has kind of uh, thrust us into that leap of faith and uh, allowed us to kind of uh, learn what it looks like at least. Um, and I think it might have been on uh, Pat Kenny, one of the news talk uh, radio shows. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was Pat Kenny last week. There was a talk about both the positives and the negatives from, from uh, working from home. I think the pandemic has allowed us to kind of assess what it's like to allow people to work from home. And we can maybe pick the best of both worlds and, and kind of model a, a situation that uh, works best for our own context and our own instance. But uh, mm -hmm. I think if you truly believe in, in what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve, there are always going to be uh, road bumps along the way. And if you can kind of uh, steer your company through a, a pandemic and for us, the disruption to support um, could have been catastrophic, but I think it was how our, our staff responded and kept the faith.
faith. And I'd, I'd, I'd highlight the effort of um, our sales manager, actually, Matt Lawless, who um, lost his own business uh, in the, the recession previously, and I suppose uh, had, had carried that burden himself and, and managed a team in a kind of a downward spiral and, and had to kind of um, learn to deal with that. And, and he was a guy that we, we leaned on uh, heavily and, and really gal- galvanized the, the troops and, and young staff members as well who mightn't have uh, had an awareness of how to kind of uh, push through the pain, if you like. Um, so he was he was very influential in in that uh, in that time period. And I think um, for all of us, there were there were bad days across the leadership team as well. There were good days and bad days. And and what we saw was that there was um, an improvement in the solidarity, even even remotely. Um, there is a great solidarity and kind of team spirit in club force and there is a great belief in in how we serve our customers and, and our commitment to maximizing participation in sport to us as individuals it's usually important and i think once you have that uh, and you believe in it and you you keep the faith i, I think you'll you'll come through anything and the pandemic may be the the, the worst of those types of things you have to come through fingers crossed <laughs> what about yourself yeah, look, I think for me, you know, it's something that, that's come up uh, again and again throughout the this kind of panel discussion, and it is, you know, all about culture. And, you know, I think it probably is, it's a 21st century thing. I think for the last five, 10 years, it has become, you know, so, so, so important to every kind of enterprise, but it, I think even it, even more so important in, in the kind of the tech industry. Um, and look, you know, the other kind of key piece as well is, you know, there hasn't it hasn't always been easy. We've probably put a gloss on it a little bit on on the wins and and uh, the the everything that's happened and and you know we were probably the lucky ones as well in that our businesses have survived and grown and scaled up and everything else. But I, I think it was just something when Paul mentioned about his, the sales manager in club force and going through the last recession. I think you know especially the the latest lockdown. I think from you know the first part of this year. I think it has built a lot of resilience in people, a lot of resilience in businesses, a, result, a lot of resilience in people as well. Um, and look, I think the key takeaway for me is, look, trust, invest in people, trust, um, helpful, empathetic, and just keep delivering that. And, you know, it's not just during a crisis. It needs to be consistent, you know, throughout all the years ahead of us. Um, and I think it'll put us uh, as business leaders and all our teams um, on the road to success then. Again, fingers crossed for that as well. Uh, Dorothy, what would be your uh, parting thoughts? Um, value your people. Ultimately, none of us are anything without the people that we're surrounded by. So having respect uh, for your people and what they go through and what everybody is going through. Um, so I think that that is the biggest thing. It, it goes back to everything everybody else is saying about culture, about trust. Uh, but ultimately, if you're in a position of leadership, you know, really value and trust your 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 people, but lead with authenticity. And for people to feel like they can perform at their best, it's if they bring their whole self to work as well. So having allowing people, you know, enabling people to to be whoever they want to be, whoever they need to be. And that's pairing that with, you know, uh, freedom of, of expression in, in a meeting. It could be looking and really trying to understand where, where do you want to get to? How can I help you progress your career? Where it's w- whether it's within the company or outside of the company. And I, I always encourage people to take on personal projects because it's really why we can always talk about our company and, and how everyone will stay here for 10 or 20 years time. The reality is quite different, right? Um, and I, I always encourage people to think ambitiously you know, looking beyond where where do you want to be within your role in the company? What is the next role? But also personally, what do you want to achieve? So it all comes down to valuing and understanding your people. Absolutely. Rory, you gave us a good gem there before we started this question. So if you don't have another one in you, don't worry. But do you have any parting thoughts for us? Um, I would say be present uh, and actively listen. I think, you know, it, it, it's probably more of a personal thing. I, I think I ran for years and years of always wanting what I didn't have in terms of the next career step, the next job, the next, 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 next. And I think, you know, I, I've certainly self-reflected a lot over the last year plus in terms of, you know, I, I don't have control of the things that I thought I had control of. Um, and actually being present and actively listening to people. And we all know when people are listening or not listening to us. Um, in, and when you kind of jump onto the, the virtual world in terms of screen time, 
you know if people are genuinely listening to what you're saying and you know that goes such a long way to how they feel but also how you lead and kind of how you strategize and how you think about what you do next um and you know that that theme has come up a lot uh, i think on this call which has been great but um i think yeah do, be, you know authentically you know being yourself being present and really taking on board what people have to say and then do something with that feedback don't shove it in your back pocket and hope that they don't ask for what happens to that piece of feedback I give you? Own it. So, you know, if you're not going to own it, don't ask for feedback. But if you, you know, in terms of growth, in terms of progress, in terms of how we kind of navigate difficult times, you got to engage people. You got to, you know, be yourself and help them be themselves. And you got to really listen, not just hear what they have to say, but listen to what they have to say um, and own that feedback. Well, they are uh, four brilliant pieces of advice for everybody watching here today. Uh, thank you so much to each of the panelists. Thank you for all of the questions and the comments. As I mentioned, you can watch this session back in full next week. Uh, but for, and for now, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jess. Thanks to Dorothy, Rory, and Brian and Paul as well. It was a great session. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Seamus. Have a Thanks, great everyone. weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody, and hopefully everyone's enjoyed the Atlantic Festival. All the best. I'll, I'll sign off from here. Thanks, everybody. Yes.